Well, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, welcome to the fifth night of our Plenary Tracker, an online forum following the progress of the Australian Catholic Church's second assembly of the historic Plenary Council. We're bringing you news and insights from the Plenary Council from Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn with the support of the Australasian Catholic Coalition for Church Reform and Garrett Publishing. My name is Genevieve Jacobs and I'm speaking to you from the traditional lands of the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri people. I acknowledge their enduring ownership of this place and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging and the traditional owners of all the places from whence you join us. Every night you'll hear from Plenary Council members, insiders, advisors, observers and others to discuss the day's events as the Council votes on issues central to the life of Catholic Church in Australia. That has been an intense space over the last couple of days. It was perhaps not the Bishop's expectation that they might create national and even international headlines with the proceedings of the Council. The purpose of this tracker is very much to engage with ordinary concerned Catholics as we build a more humble, transparent and inclusive church. So as the conversation unfolds, please use the Q&A function on your screens to send us questions right through to the discussion. We'll get to those questions around about halfway through the session. I'll bring some more in as I see them arrive. I don't promise that we'll reach them all or in the exact form that they're posed, but we will do our best to cover a diverse range of queries. And please do keep your queries courteous and clear and direct. These have been tough discussions. Other listeners may have different beliefs. It's not a space for disparagement, despite the powerful feelings that are attached to many issues. James McEwen is our technical administrator. Please message him through the Q&A if you're experiencing any difficulties. This edition of the Plenary Tracker will run for around about 45 minutes. If you're curious about the motions and amendments of the Council, they're published on the Plenary Council's website at plenarycouncil, or one word, .catholic.org.au. And you can support this webinar series and all the work of Concerned Catholics Canberra Goulburn via the front page of the Concerned Catholics website. But first to the news, the Assembly scrambled today to make up for lost time after yesterday's dramatic disruption over the rejection of motions advancing the role of women in the church. Today, members appeared to feel more empowered and didn't allow the urgency of playing catch up to deter them from speaking out. Vice President Bishop Shane McKinlay introduced a more flexible way for the plenary to gauge the mood in the room as it discussed motions on implementing Pope Francis's Laudato Si vision for ecology and the environment, and more on church governance, participation and formation. But the forced rethink on women has been greeted by the National Catholic Reform Group as a potential a statement that they were pleased the bishops have to reconsider them. Just revealed in his blog today that the protest in the assembly saw women joined by male delegates and a couple of bishops. McKinley told the Sydney Morning Herald that many bishops were as distressed as others at the shock defeat of key motions on women. The issues will be revisited tomorrow, but not one of the bishops who voted against the motions has offered an explanation to the assembly. Our topics tonight are governance and ecology. I'm joined first by Plenary Council member Virginia Burke, a Melbourne lawyer and consultant. She is the chair of Mercy Health and a director of Catholic Health Australia, the Martyr Group and Caritas Australia. Virginia has just taken up an appointment as pro-chancellor of the Australian Catholic University. And we'll also speak shortly to Dr. Jackie Raymond, co-founder of the Laudato Si movement, formerly known as the Global Catholic Climate Movement, co-coordinator of the Vatican Ecology Task Force and leader integral ecology at the Australian Catholic University. Dr. Patricia Hindmarsh also joins us. She's a retired teacher and leader in Catholic education with a lifelong interest in justice, peace and ecology. She's just published Ecological Spirituality, Caring for Our Current Home, a Common Home for Garrett Publications Faith Today series. She's an active member of the Bernie Catholic Parish and a life member of Women in the Australian Church and a co-founder of Concerned Catholics Tasmania. Virginia Burke, let me start with you. After high drama that did indeed hit international headlines, did the council regather and what's changed in its operations? Well, thanks, Genevieve, and good evening, everyone. Uh, yes, look, it was high drama yesterday, but I do think we regrouped quite well. Um, a lot of energy was expended yesterday. I think uh, 
some of us were a little weary, but having said that, we had a very, we worked very hard today, I think, and I do think it was a productive day. So um, that is a positive, I think. Um, we did, actually, each day has started with absolutely fabulous liturgies. So, uh, you know, I have enjoyed um, being part of the music ministry in my parish for many years, and it is just, a, you know, a stellar liturgy performance. So I do want to mention that because in all the drama and the serious matters discussed, I think it's important to recognise that contribution. So that's been a highlight for me. Uh, yes, uh, the um, Vice President, Bishop uh, Shane McKinley, did outline all of the changes uh, to the agenda that were necessitated by the disruption yesterday, and we were then informed about a, a changed process as well, about how we would proceed. And I actually think that process, which is um, more, more streamlined, I think, and a little more focused on the, on the framework document and the motions at hand, um, the use of straw polls so you can gauge the sort of feeling in the room about what is it that we wish to discuss. Uh, people coming up to the microphone and giving it sort of fairly direct uh, one minute commentary on either a question or, a, you know, a comment or a, um, perhaps suggesting some kind of change. So all of that, I think, made it a more focused process. And um, I think there was a sense in the room that that flexibility was was very good for all of us. And we were getting through things and and hearing directly from people as to their issues on the exact motions before us, it was, it was, it was good really, I, I found it helpful. I, I do have a number of questions that have come in already and many of them around the same theme. Um, Jill saying, in the interest of transparency, can we know which bishops stood with the women yesterday? Uh, Dr. Peter Schneider says, I read a very good comment today, who on earth do they think they are? Terry says, will ordinary mugs in the pews get to know how the bishops voted? And Michael says, please encourage your guests to speak openly and without hesitation. It's frustrating when speakers are hesitant and perhaps unclear about what's happened during the day. Virginia, it does seem as if Shane McKinlay is attempting to bring more energy and a little more transparency and clarity to the process. There's yeah. nevertheless a sense of, of uh, a certain sense of secrecy still adheres to these processes, doesn't it? Look, I think today um, Bishop Shane did a very good job of directly answering uh, issues that were raised and we and a sort of more activist chair approach as well. So the sessions are all chaired by uh, by other people, um, Bishop Shane is there as the vice president. So I thought that the combination of a sort of more active chairing, um, the vice president being there to answer questions directly, to deal with some matters directly on the floor with everyone there, everyone listening. I thought that was a more transparent process actually. And I think we, all, you know, everyone in the room, I think felt that it was moving along quite well. In relation to just generally, sorry, just in relation to matters that can be spoken of, it is, you know, we, we're not at the votes that happen today, for instance, until they're made public. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's fair. But other than that, I've done a number of, you know, media briefings and activities, as have many Assembly members. And I think there's a sense that, you know, we are able to speak. And, um, and so I, I don't feel constrained in that way. So I just reassure listeners that um, I think there are some proper rules about what you can say about today's activities. They'll be revealed tomorrow and that's fine. And look, we'll go to the discussion about governance and ecology in just a moment, but what happens now with regard to the motions around women and men, leadership and equality? Yeah, so this morning we were advised that those, um, the, the motions would come back tomorrow, Friday. And um, we were, just as we left this evening, were the actual um, part four, rewritten part four. So the, work, the, the drafting group worked all day on that. We were delivered the document just as we left this evening so people can consider it overnight. I haven't actually had a chance to read that as I've come straight to this, but um, that um, I think there's great hope really that, that we can sort of revisit that and um, have a good discussion about it tomorrow and then see how we go tomorrow. So that will be dealt with tomorrow as, as I understand it. And just another procedural question, and I think it is important to clarify these things if we can. Gary asks, why are the reservations or qualifications in votes not subject to discernment by the whole council? Well, I'm not sure. I don't know that I have the answer to that. It may be that you require a canon lawyer for that answer. Um, it may be that the, this is the deliberative voting process um, where the Yorkster modems were uh, an issue. And I'm sure perhaps, the, the, well, I'm not sure actually, but the bishops may well have discussed that amongst themselves, but that's not been a matter that's been discussed with the assembly. 
Yes, and Kerry also asked why can't the plenary discussions be fully available online? So there is a great cry for clarity and transparency from our audience, Virginia Burke. But look, I do want to ask you too, after all the drama, there's now so much being done in a very narrow remaining window of time. And we had from the very beginning of the Plenary Council quite a lot of concern about whether there was enough time to get through the program before we even got to the major disruptions of the last day or two. And can you actually manage to get through this in time? Um, well, that's you know it's a fair enough question given given yesterday's events. But uh, today moved along very well, and I think I'm quite optimistic that we can get through the program. Though I think it's a fair question. As I was leaving tonight, one of the leaders of the women's congregation said to me, "You know, we have six week chapters because there's so much to be done." You know, so yeah, I, I'm aware of how compressed it is. Uh, but look, it's a huge undertaking. There's people, you know, from all over Australia, people who are, you know. Of taking time without leave from their jobs and all of that it's it's a huge thing and so there's a sense that we want to make the most of every minute that we've got there so I do think the members are working really hard to get through it I think we can get through it this the different process has helped it's it's sped up things in a good way like you know I think we're getting to the heart of things people are speaking frankly and I think that's that's helpful that that will help us get through this through the motions and do you think it's possible to rescue a sense of unity. We've had a strong sense of divisions between conservatives and progressives within the, the council among the delegates becoming even deeper. Can we work through that? Well, it, that's interesting because even amongst yesterday's, you know, there were highly contested issues yesterday, people very upset. Not every, every of course, there were very, you know, there were polarised views on things, but nonetheless, and this is what I've found very admirable is that people who are deeply opposed in view have gone up to each other and spoken to each other and, you know, worked through each other's viewpoints. That has been a feature of the assembly that has perhaps surprised me because it takes some courage to do that and it's uncomfortable and it's difficult, but that has happened here. So I think it's important to, to note that I, I actually felt today um, the dynamic was really quite good considering what would, had happened yesterday. Um, people got into the sort of new process in a sort of, um, uh, in a, uh, I wouldn't say, I don't want to say relaxed, but people were like getting on with it, you know, they sort of, we'd had the big, <laughs> big blow up yesterday, if you like. And I think that maybe surfaced a lot of tensions and now it's like, what, we've got to deal with these tensions. They're here, you know, we can name them, let's get on with it. So I don't, I don't see it as divisive. Um, I, I think it's, kind of healthy in a way, to bring it to the surface, discuss it. Um, I don't see it as a, an all out threat to unity. I think we can get to where we need to go. I really do, I really do think that. But very briefly, the debates today were around governance and ecology. Take us through those, the, the motions that, that came forward. Yes, uh, well, uh, part eight was the um, integral ecology uh, motions. And that was sort of the most of the morning session and look, this actually, to your point about unity, I think this is an area where, uh, like most of the community, people are quite energised. People are, have, most people have um, strong views or are on board with the need for some action. So I think this was a good topic for us to get stuck into this morning because um, people had a lot to say about it and, um, and it was uh, a very constructive sort of discussion to have. So I think that was really good. We had, um, of course, the introductory statement was discussed and there were comments made about how that could be improved um, or people had questions about it. And then I think the main motion that we looked at, and I'm just referring to my book because we've dealt with so many motions today. Um, the main one um, uh, we accepted, you know, the introductory statement was discussed. And then also we looked at um, the, um, the motion that deals with each uh, Catholic parish and diocesan organisation um, engaging or developing a Laudato C action plan. And there were some good discussions. Uh, people raised the issue of urgency. Um, you know, I think 2030 might have been the number in the, the motion. So, there, you know, good discussions about what can we do, what's possible, um, how, how can it really work. There had to be a level of uh, generality to, to this motion because each organisation has different ways, I think, of approaching it. Um, but I'll be really interested to hear from Jackie about uh, her views on that later. 
So that was part eight, that was ecology. And then we went to part seven, which was um, uh, at the service of communion, um, participation, mission, governance. And again, um, this was largely dealing with uh, synodality in terms of um, the way that dioceses and parishes operate. There was you know, a requirement for our diocesan synod was discussed, um, light from the Southern Cross, the way in which um, the initiatives that have been taken up can be affirmed and, um, and generally discussions about a proposal on a national Catholic synodal life, life roundtable. So it's quite considerable discussion about that. Mm. So look, I'll bring in Trish Heimarsh and Jackie Raymond at this point. Um, and Jackie, I, I want to start by asking you to very briefly cover what Laudato C is and aims to do. I, I think we're certainly hearing more and more about it at parish and diocesan level, but just take us through what Laudato C is aiming to do and change within the church. Thanks, Genevieve. And I'll just start by acknowledging that I'm on Yaru country. So I'm speaking from this amazing place here and acknowledging the traditional owners, some of whom are with you in the plenary council. Um, Laudato C is really a significant teaching that's happened because it's placed a sense of understanding about the agency of God's creation in our lives. So it's not something that's a backdrop. It's constantly acting, evolving, responding and loving in God's sense of what this is all about. So Pope Francis provided us with this teaching in 2015. And really, it's a comprehensive look at the way um, our reality at this time and how uh, our teachings have always been about loving God's handiwork of creation, but actually we're at a point where we need to embrace this from a paradigm perspective of integral ecology. This means that we hold everything as interconnected in the way we see it, feel it, understand it and come to love it. So this, this shift is about not just how we think and feel, it's about how we're acting with a sense of care for all creation. And that's something we haven't been doing well. We've actually done something incredibly dangerous with our faith and separated our faith often from God's creation. And, and we are seeing the major fallouts uh, it's causing untold suffering to so many people and to so much of creation, ecosystems, um, biodiversity, and now the stability of our very climate, our water, our food, our well-being is at stake. Jackie, there does seem to be a growing sense of urgency, as Virginia just said, about the implementation for the timetable. Just talk to me, though, about developing an ecological perspective in church and growing a culture of care, because I think there will be some in the pews who will say, I have no idea how or why this is connected with my religious faith. Absolutely. I think that is a huge part of the gap of education and understanding that our beliefs centred on our, you know, our whole tradition holds this wholeness. You know, that's what Catholic means is universality and wholeness a wholeness about who we are connected with God's creation. And yet our faith has pursued a path of holding a human-centred focus. And now with the industrialised civilization, a very techno-centric or technocratic worldview is pervading us all the time. So our faith is calling us, and Pope Francis in particular with his leadership, but so many in the past, um, St Francis of Assisi we know and love so much, has called us to see the connectedness of everything. So in the pews now, it's an opportunity to connect our sacred scripture stories about creation, seeing and reading it through an ecological hermeneutic. It's about seeing Catholic social teaching as being about not only healing our relationships with one another, the human family, healing our relationships with all creation and with our creator God. So it's a, it's a deep call and it's about maturing in our faith as humans on the planet, seeing our purpose, seeing our role and why we're here through this ecologically connected lens as much as it's connected culturally, socially and in, in that human sense. 
So there's something really important about the way we reflect, the way we pray, the way our structures enable us to go through processes of constant conversion, which brings the ecological into our frame and see ourselves turning together to God, not just as the human family, but with creation, turning to God and being in communion. So there's something about how we connect in our habitats, you know, in our local parish backyards, in our local human home spaces, and organisationally we're called to change the way we are setting up our mission and our vision so that it includes the ecological. So this includes our policies, our strategies, our strategic planning, holding that ecological sense of life. This is the way God's acting all the time. We need to get beyond ourselves to do that. And I think that's probably what you were talking about, Virginia, that today coming back to be in this plenary process together and looking at creation puts us in a bigger perspective of, of how God acts and is. And that means that we can get past some of those things that we find, you know, challenging at the moment in church. Uh, because when we have that bigger perspective, we can come back to those smaller, maybe more ego-centered ways and go, actually, I can work through this differently now. We are unified. And that that's a really important aha moment that perhaps happened for people today. And in fact, there's a, a lovely comment in the questions from Andrew Fraser, who says, look, it's appropriate to link church governance and ecological spirituality, because modern science has taught us about how the amazing diversity of life evolved from one creative event, the Big Bang. He refers to the canticle of the universe. And he says, so too does church governance need to let a thousand flowers bloom, not to let them wither on the vine through an oppressive administrative structure centered in Rome. Governance needs to celebrate our diversity while recognising our oneness in Christ. Uh, Trish, could, could I come to you and ask what ecological conversion means? Jackie used that phrase a moment ago. What is that? Oh, I think you're still muted, Trish. I was so interested, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> I, I'm speaking from Trewinna, Tasmania, and I'm very much on Palawa country. In fact, we live in the bush, so there would have been hundreds of thousands, millions and trillions of footsteps that have walked across our, our land here where we live over the millennia. It's a sacred place, as, of course, all of creation is sacred. But look, to the point of ecological conversion, it's a phrase that's become part of our Catholic lexicon. And um, I remember only 15 years ago, Jackie would be part of this journey too. It was almost as anathema as a Catholic church to speak about ecology and environment as integral to faith, as it was yesterday to mm -hmm. some people to speak about the full inclusion of women. It was, it was almost a no-no. It was associated with the radical lunatic fringe, the, the far left, something that we Catholics looked at suspiciously a bit because it was associated with the green movement, whether it was in Germany or Tasmania. It was almost a, a, a dirty word. I don't want to exaggerate it too much. And in those years, largely thanks to the leadership in the church of the, the popes. In fact, Laudato Si goes right back to Paul VI, and then it speaks about um, Benedict, of course, and John Paul II, and now Francis. Uh, it is so clear that what we're called to by our baptism is an ecological conversion that will allow us to do what Jackie was outlining so beautifully for us, to encompass in our hearts and our lives this, this understanding, this um, commitment to respect and love and treat and cherish and extend with all our hearts to everyone on the planet uh, a share in this glorious work of creation and to lament. We lamented sexual abuse, you know, on Tuesday and last year, we lamented that as never been lamented before in the church possibly. We also need to lament the fact that we have so devastated this, this planet. Uh, but I find it really encouraging that this particular strand has been included as a part, with a capital P, of the, the council agenda, a separate part. But on the other hand, 
I think that if we take this ecological conversion to its natural conclusion, the creation theology, the spirituality of creation, acknowledging God's gift expressed through love in creating the cosmos, and then earth as our closest contact with this cosmos, and then Jesus as the manifestation of, of God become human, all of that, we need to appreciate that within that ecological conversion is a realization that everything God has made is sacred. Now it was quoted actually in, in the introduction, the systems of life and love are deeply interconnected. Um, ec ecological conversion is a call to defend all of life. So what about the LGBTI plus um, people? They are an ecological plus, you know, they're, they're a diverse manifestation of God's creation, uh, not a minority manifestation, but part of God's creation. They, they deserve the love, the cherishing, the care, the particular welcome of our church as affirmative action in their favour now that we've woken up to ourselves or partly anyway. I mean, the science is there. Can I and just the other one on is, that? sorry. I just want to ask you on that. If, have you come up against some who suspect you're trying to politicise the church? Because there has been huge division in this country on environmental issues and a real polarisation that's left and right. Are there those who say a focus on ecology is a deliberate politicisation? I think it's a very, a very few. We actually had an incident here in Tasmania recently where a climate denier was invited to be a major speaker at a Catholic auspiced organisation. And there was an outcry across Tasmania. People said, this is unworthy of our church. This is unworthy of Laudato Si. There was overt criticism. Laudato Si is not based on good science. It's, it's politically naive, et cetera, et cetera people rush to defend the Pope in a way in which you wouldn't believe because our, our Pope has done careful scientific research, got the best analysis, scientific basis that was possible to create Laudato C. So there are small pockets that are still very much in, of that sort of uh, mould whereby 15 years ago, many in the church would have avoided this issue, you know, seen it as, as not directly related to our baptismal commitment. I think those days are way behind us. The fact that this is so upfront of the council, almost every parish in Australia knows now that we have a Laudato Si platform. Many of them are working really hard, producing their own little documents, having their meetings, setting up their committees. They know that the Pope wants us to do it. The, the religious orders are all doing it. Um, the hospitals, I'm sure, Virginia, that, you, you know, your organisation would be working on this. We're going to have Laudato Sea goals sprouting up everywhere. And if that's not recognition that the Pope's call to ecological conversion is real, urgent and connected to our baptism, I don't know what is. And it's happening all over the world. We've got a marvellous dicastery. Jackie knows more about this than I do, working for integral human development. And out of that is coming some fantastic uh, work. And, and it's making an impact, but in many ways, it's too little too late because the young people and the, 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 the greenies in inverted commas, those who've been totally committed to ecology for years and years and years, have been looking at our church and wondering when we'd wake up. We had all the, all the material there but thank God now it's overt, it's mainstream, it's on the agenda. Ecological conversion is, is as real as going to confession was 45 years ago. I've got some lovely comments about this. Um, Kathy says, it's not real to speak of sacred and profane. The whole of creation is the sacrament of God. We have to get beyond the official seven sacraments. And Jerry, yeah. Says, yeah. as Jackie speaks, I can't help but be aware of how far away our chief liturgical prepared the mass, which is supposed to be the source and summit of our prayer life, is a way from helping us inculcate and incarnate that sense of spirituality in our lives. Uh, Jackie, before we turn to the governance strand, I, I do want to ask you about the church's relationship with First Nations Australians, because that integral ecological focus is deeply linked to the relationships with First Nations people for you, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. And I think that's a huge message in Laudato Si when Pope Francis talks about the fact 
that our Indigenous brothers and sisters all around the world need to be our principal dialogue partners when we make decisions about anything to do with the land, with the seas, with creation. And that's our constant work. That's where that's the field in which we live, move and have our being. So, so this is a massive invitation. And he went directly then to engage in the process of the Synod on the Amazon. And in the Australian context, we're really blessed to have great leadership through the Federation of the Catholic Bishops Conference of Oceania with Archbishop Peter Lloyd Chong in Fiji is the president of that conference, conferences of bishops, leading the call to care for Oceania in the fullest sense of what that means. So the assembly is being prepared for February next year. And we're on that synodal ecological conversion journey together. So the culture of care that we're called to attend to each other as brothers and sisters, and there's so much joy that comes with that. There's so much richness and learning. There's great mistakes. There's all sorts of, you know, messiness in those relational fields that we need to get really real about. And I think this is the invitation at this time to become friends with our Aboriginal brothers and sisters. That's that's the call of Jesus. You know, I call you friends. We're called to be those friends. Have we been living up to that? Not well enough. And so this is the time where we need to have conversations at a heart level about what it means to walk in solidarity and friendship with this land, with this sense of culture and people and practice. And there's so much that comes from that that is going to help us grow as an Australian church. We need to do this. It, it's, it's no longer optional. It is really about seeing our churches as places that can regenerate the hope and energy needed to prepare the future of this country, to co-create the pathways that lead to uh, well-being, fullness of, of, you know, healthy lives, good food, uh, clean waterways, all of these things are absolutely essential for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, as well as all the creatures that inhabit this unique country and these many, many lands. So it involves language. We need to learn language of, of our local places. We need to identify that at the beginning of our masses and not just as token bookends, but to actually embrace it in ways that is dialogical, that brings the liturgy into fullness. You know, I've been here for NAIDOC week on Yaru country. It's been absolutely magnificent to be part of and experience and have my children experience what goes on when we bring up uh, the bread and the wine and what other gifts we bring to that, how we can play music and the clap sticks and all that's part of the didge playing. This goes through to our souls. This is what we need to hear. This is what uh, is going to help wake us up uh, to where we are and to live here in the fullness that God wants, I think. Now, I've got some wonderful comments coming in. One from Edward who says, why cannot these incredible women run our church? <laughs> they are certainly prophets. They have suffered and worked tirelessly in their true leaders. Thank God the Spirit's given us Francis to encourage their early reading of the signs of these key times. Another comment that says, I think the focus on the seven goals of Laudato Si helps us to see the relevance here. Shane says, great to see Jackie front and centre on this issue. She's a warrior for restoring the sacredness of earth and all creation to its rightful place in our theology and practice. And uh, I think, Virginia Burke, I'm very much hoping that we've got you back now. I know you've been having a little bit of a problem with the Wi-Fi. Um, can you see and hear us? I think you're still on mute. I think I'm here now, Genevieve. I am sorry. I've um, got a Wi-Fi problem here and a 4G problem as well, it looks like. So apologies to oh, look, that, that's the audience okay. and to the panel. Look, I, and I, I did want to go to you on governance because if we're discussing the impact of social movements as we are with Laudato Si and the, the growing momentum and, and indeed the real joy around ecological conversion and engagement, the concept of governance is not a million miles away from leadership in social change. Of course, that's what's prompted the headlines around the Plenary Council. Can you talk to us about the governance issues that were discussed today and how that fits in with a momentum for change and a progressive approach? Yes, I suppose the um, the main discussion was actually about 
synodality. It's been a bit of a theme over, I suppose, the, the few days. And also because we are right in amongst it as well. So I think there's um, some people have, uh, you know, quite optimistic about synodality, but I think there is, uh, you know, some concern, you know, how will it really work? Is it really appropriate um, to, to use in all forms of governance? So it's, it's, there's an that experimental element, I think, to what, what we are doing. So that's been part of sort of general informal and formal discussions. Um, one of the main uh, emotions that we discussed was one that affirmed the use of synodal practices, I think, in uh, diocesan and parish bodies. And um, we had a terrific uh, address by Sister Moya Hanlon, a lawyer and just an expert in this area. It was really good. And she pointed out that I think about a third um, I think that's right, a third of dioceses have diocese and pastoral councils. So there's still quite a way to go there. Um, so that really was quite a discussion. Um, but I think some dioceses seem to have different ideas about what will work for them and, and, and so on. But the, the, motion, the motion before us was the diocese and pastoral council and, um, and also parish pastoral councils. So I think in general, it was quite a good measured sort of discussion. Um, mm. And there was also a, a motion in relation to the initiatives in light from the Southern Cross. And uh, you know, I, I'd been really highly engaged in reading and understanding uh, that report when it came out. I found it very impressive. I found it really quite moderate in its uh, proposals. But, but it was, you know, it was uh, received in some quarters with, you know, dismay, I suppose. And certainly there was a response by the Bishop's Conference to it. Uh, and that was recognised today. There was discussion about that as well. Um, but the motion was that um, the church um, recognise and affirm the many initiatives that are actually working from that. So I was pleased to see really, a, you know, a positive aspect to that. What is working? And what, what can we then roll out in other areas? I think, you know, we need sort of some proof of, um, of concept really, I think. Uh, so that was that was discussed. I was pleased to see it there because I think it is a really important report. And I think, um, Trish, I did hear some of your discussion about inclusion. And for me, the Life in the Southern Cross report did capture that sense of, you know, we need to include the whole of the people of God and the practices and initiatives in that report, that's where they were targeted. So that, that was some of the discussions um, that we were having today. And I, um, I think we are starting to see, perhaps Virginia, there's a sense of how this all does circle around and become interconnected, particularly around the theme of inclusiveness and the expanse of, of God's creation. Um, a comment from Martin on, on the Q&A saying, Laudato Si is a reconciliation with our body, with science and with our land. First Nations people never separated those. So there is a sense of, of a vision of the creation as a whole that's emerging from these conversations, isn't there? Yeah, I think that's right. I'm not sure that we, you know, we, we considered these matters separately in the, um, in the assembly today. So I'm very interested in this conversation and a little sorry that I haven't caught all, all the nuances really, but I think that that would actually really have enriched the discussion. So it's, a, it's very interesting to me to have drawn that connection. Um, but the good thing about the intense nature of the work of the assembly is that these sort of connections can be made because you're looking at these things and you're getting repeating themes coming back in. Um, so I think, yeah, that is a, it's a terrific connection to make, really. And, and Trish, I might go to you on that. I've got a question from Pat Wood who says, I believe strongly in ecological conversion, but what about conversion in relation to social justice for disadvantaged people? Yeah, well, that's the great strength of Laudat I see is that the Pope stresses again and again and, and the social justice statement that the Australian bishops put out pick this up in its title. It's the cry of the earth is intimately linked to the cry of the poor. We can't separate those. Uh, we used to, we were very anthropocentric in our social justice teachings prior to this. I think it wouldn't be unfair to say that. They were all focused on human suffering um, caused by humans who are acting unjustly towards each other. We now know that our devastation of earth through our carelessness and our abuse of earth, our overuse of earth systems, our lack of respect, et cetera, hits hardest those who are poorest. It's almost like a vicious circle. They were poor 
Now they're poorer and poorer as their land is denuded by bulldozers to grow cash crops to create profit for multinationals. As their rivers are poisoned by uh, gold mines just upstream that are putting their tailings into the rivers. You could go on and on and the Pope gives some very strong examples. He said, we must never separate the suffering earth from the suffering poor. It's, that's part of the integral ecology. So I think that's a big advance in the development of Catholic social teaching in recent years. Uh, it's moved from anthropocentric to creation centric. And I think we need to move a lot more of our theology and our thinking, even around something like governance. Uh, most of the issues, sacramentality, they all need to draw sustenance from creation theology, which is about God's mission to the cosmos was to bring love alive through the gifts of creation and that this planet is a, is a microcosm of that cosmic love that we can relate to, but we need to um, live out our commitment to be Catholics on this planet in a way that respects everyone, the whole of the species, but of course, our human sisters and brothers in a way that shares the, the goods of earth. So you can't separate them in, in modern Catholic social, contemporary 21st century Catholic social teaching, you can't separate them. Virginia, part seven today touched on the service of communion, on participation and mission. Talk to me about how the sacraments came into the conversation that you were having. You're, you're on mute, Virginia. Sorry, that was actually part, we actually got on it later in the day, we actually got on to part five, which was um, communion in grace, um, sacrament in the world. So that is actually a separate part. And um, that was quite um, an energised discussion. And I think in part because I'd say pretty much everyone in the room has, you know, experience of the sacraments. It was something that really got everyone going. Mm -hmm. And um, I suppose the, some of the key issues there were um, the third rite of reconciliation, um, there's, there's strong views on that. Um, and the other aspect was the Ministry of Preaching also. Um, and there's a couple of motions to do with that. So that discussion is, you know, is ongoing. We're sort of partway through that discussion. And in fact, just late in the day, we did start a discussion too on um, part six. So, but just to back onto the sacraments, um, one, one aspect that came through strongly for me and the value of having people in the assembly from all parts of Australia, including very remote parts, is this sense of, um, uh, someone mm. described it to me as a sort of a deprivation of the sacraments in some parts of regional and outback Australia. And that's obviously something that's painful and difficult, not a deprivation, deprivation in, in the terms of community because rural and regional communities are very good at community, but this, you know, the, the unavailability of sacraments in some areas. So that was probably, you know, a couple, and also sustainability of parishes in regional and rural areas was a consistent theme um, throughout the day, really. Yes, and look, I, I, I always reflect on my 91-year-old mother who said, uh, I haven't left the Catholic Church, the Catholic Church has left me um, in, in Western New South Wales, and that is unfortunately absolutely true in a, in a very practical sense. Look, a couple more comments that, that uh, I'll go to. Um, Monica says on the subject of... The bishops vote and I cannot tell you how many comments there are in the Q&A last night and tonight saying how do I find out how my bishop voted. Um, it's, it's an extraordinary eagerness to know among participants what our what the, our respective bishops did. Monica says canon law clearly allows for church authority to give a deliberative vote contrary to the consultative vote but for contrary votes to be valid it has to be for good reason and canon law doesn't articulate what might constitute such good reason. Monica says, in the interest of accountability and transparency, surely those good reasons need to be made public in order to validate a deliberative contrary to a consultative vote. Um, and another comment from Peter Schneider, who talks about whether religion perhaps echoes an anachronistic worldview or an archaic vision of reality, that it doesn't have enough to say about the experience of the sacred in creation that it sort of possesses a, a spirit that seems super, supernatural and otherworldly and out there, rather than teaching us to live harmoniously with nature. Um, and Peter suggests it's time to revisit our theology of the ecology. 
Um, uh, Mary Coombe says, has anyone thought of linking the homily from Sunday and asking the non platchet bishops why they are prepared to leave women in exile from the centre of the church? And Michael's comment is, it sounds like Laudato Si is a bombshell that's just exploded at the council, but it's seven years ago. We've moved beyond this in the real world. People are so much more engaged. And echoing that, Mike says, I love how Richard Raw speaks of God actually being the connector us within and between everything. Um, Jackie Raymond, I, I want to just go back to you perhaps for a final comment on that, because it does seem in the conversation we've had tonight, interestingly enough, as Virginia says, around ecology and governance, that, we, that we've struck something really interesting here about a way forward that's to do with the whole diverse beauty of creation. And really quickly, if you could, we've, we're just a minute or two from the time where we need to end. Yes, that's exactly right. You know, if you look at the pattern of God's creation, it is absolutely full of diversity. And so this is our time to not only accept that, but to love it. And it is also important that we see the immense complexity in creation and that we shouldn't be put off by the complexity in the human condition as well. This is part of the journey. This is what it means to respond. And I have to add that this decade is the decade that matters most. So one of the comments about this area that's in the documentation that's being voted on is that there isn't enough sense of everyone being invited for the first time ever implementing a document, an encyclical, through a platform being offered by the Vatican where everyone can get on board and over seven years undergo this fullness of conversion in a synodal way together. This is our moment to do that and we need to because there is so much that's going on. I mean, look at the floods happening again in Sydney at where you are meeting for this event. It's a sign of the times that there's constant and repeated uh, increasing frequencies going on in this case. So embracing that diversity, that's our mission, holding and loving the complexity and working, as you were saying earlier, Virginia, through that. So thanks for uh, um, this great conversation. And thanks, Trish, you're an amazing inspiration to Thank me. You, Jackie. Yes, Jackie's my inspiration too. So. <laughs> Well, I think that this is there's, there's a wonderful degree of warmth in this conversation. Lots of people thanking you on the Q and A for your wisdom, your thoughtfulness, all three of you, and um, and some some wonderful comments coming through. Uh, Benjamin O, who was one of our panelists uh, a night or two ago, said God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was good. very good. How did we arrive at the point where we've created second class goods? and turn people and our planet's goods into inferior goods. Isn't this sin of exclusion the source of this damage? And a number of other comments suggesting that perhaps we need to turn the sacraments towards this kind of vision of creation. Yeah. All that God made was very good. Look, thank you all very much for being with us this yes. evening. This is actually thank my you. last evening on the tracker. Um, bishops or not, I have a minor surgical pr procedure scheduled tomorrow and Paul Bongiorno, who's an exceptionally capable presenter, will be in the chair. And uh, many of you know him from his story career as a press gallery correspondent. He and I always get a bit of a professional kick out of being back in the saddle and broadcasting. The tracker is a team effort. So I do want to thank the team from Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn, the indefatigable Judith Tockley, the daily insights from John Warhurst and Francis Sullivan, the support from Mark Metherell, Paul Collins, and so many others, and of course our technical producer, James McEwen. You can also follow the council's progress via several blogs. Uh, Francis, Francis Sullivan has been writing his blog on Catholic social services. John Warhurst's blog can be found with Concerned Catholics, Canberra Goulburn. Geraldine Doog is also following the process. All those links are on the respective web pages and those of Garrett Publishing. Tomorrow night and the final tracker will be joined by John Warhurst, Sister Mel Dwyer and others to recap on a week that by many accounts may turn out to be a pivotal point in the history of Catholic Church in Australia. So thank you to all of my guests today. Terrific to have your company and please join us for the final night tomorrow night. Thank you everyone. <laughs>